More than 30 years ago, the project on the history of black writing began its investment in preserving and recovering the history of black writing. Today, we remain committed to creating critical spaces for teaching, learning, researching, and presenting black literature both in the US and globally. As such, we're very pleased to present our second webinar in Black Poetry After the Black Arts Movement, a summer institute created by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our special guest today is Sharon Strange, poet and co-founder of the Darkroom Collective. I'm Laura Verana, a PhD candidate at Penn State. One quick logistical note for our viewers before we get started. In order to facilitate interaction with our guests today, we will be using two of the tools that you will find in the upper left-hand corner of your webinar window. We will use the chat tool to provide immediate feedback. Think of it as a place for virtual applause, encouragement, and comments. We will use the Q&A tool as a place to collect questions for the poet to answer during the course of the webinar. You are encouraged to please use both actively. You might start now by using that chat window to provide a special virtual welcome to our guest today, poet Sharon. Sharon Strange, American poet and professor, is one of the co-founders of the Darkroom Collective in Boston in the late 1980s, a gathering of African-American writers and artists that for a decade gave support to the careers of such visionary and now award-winning black poets as Thomas Sayers Ellis, Natasha Trethewey, Kevin Young, Tracy K. Smith, and of course, Professor Strange herself. Her collection, Ash, was the recipient of the 2000 Barnard New Women Poets Prize and was published through Beacon Press with an introduction by Sonia Sanchez. Strange's poetry has also been published in numerous literary journals and anthologies, including The Best American Poetry 1994, 1996 anthology, The Garden Thrives, 20th Century African American Poetry, The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South, and such journals as Callaloo, American Poetry Review, and Painted Bride Quarterly. Her poems have been nominated for or received major awards, such as the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and the Pushcart Prize, and she has served as a contributing and advisory editor for the major journal of African American Literary and Cultural Studies, Callaloo. Strange received her undergraduate degree from Harvard University and an MFA from Sarah Lawrence, and has taught or served as writer in residence at numerous institutions of higher education, including Fisk University, Wheaton College, the University of California at Davis, among others. She is currently teaching writing at Spelman College in Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sharon Strange. And we're getting a bunch of different comments. People are saying, welcome, keep being lovely and amazing. So some enthusiastic viewers who are excited to have you here with us, Professor Strange. Well, thank you. That's wonderful to hear. And hello to everybody out there in the, in the cyberverse that I can't see you, but it's wonderful to know that you're out there and uh, sharing in this uh, conversation today. Yes, thank you so much. So Professor Strange is going to um, begin maybe by reading a few works for us, and then we will switch to some questions and maybe she will return to a couple poems later as well. Um, so feel free to start posing questions, viewers, if you have things through that Q&A tool. Um, and we will also look forward first to hearing, maybe if we're lucky, a couple of poems from Professor Strange. So. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I will read a few poems, and I think I will I'll start with some poems from Ash, uh, which uh, folks may be familiar with, but then again, there are always people who aren't familiar um, with your work. So uh, again, for the folks who are familiar, I, um, I hope you uh, enjoy hearing these again, and, and then uh, I want to read a few of them because, again, um, I think they speak to some of the questions and concerns that we'll probably address today around my poetry and around um, Black American poetry. So um, I guess I'll start at the beginning um, with this poem titled Childhood. Summer brought fireflies in swarms. They lit our evenings like dreams we thought we couldn't have. We caught them in jars, punched, Holes carried them around for days. 
Luminous abdomens that when charged with air turn bright. Imagine mere insects carrying such cargo. Magical caravans flickering beneath low July skies. We chase them, amazed. The idea, those tiny bodies pulsing phosphorescence. They made reckless traffic, signaling neon flashes forever into the deepening dusk. They gave us new faith in the nasty tonics of childhood, pungent murky liquids promising shining eyes, strong teeth, glowing skin. So we silently vowed to swallow ever after. What was the secret of light? We wanted their brilliance, small fires hovering, each tiny explosion, the birth of a new world. <clears throat> Hunger, one, combing the papers for summer jobs, nothing that seems absurd now or the obvious hustle was beneath us. Our need was rampant as newsprint, those endless columns of pulp dreams. Not old enough for hire, I fantasized my future in stuffing envelopes. Excuse me, I fantasized my fortune in stuffing envelopes. Seductive ads beckoned, make dollars, no experience needed, just gut-wrenching desire for anything more. I'd make thousands, save the family, buy my way out of loneliness, invisibility. I sent off letters, stamps tasting of promise, expectations swelling in me like a secret. Two, I yearned for glimpses of freedom, like clearings stumbled upon, meadows of unbroken green edged by trees, yet seemingly endless, like that but interior, as in the mind's infinite reaches, hinted at in dreams, or the openness the heart allows each time we choose love. Going into fields where my grandmother eked out a sharecropper's wage, before I learned they weren't hers, they too seemed unbounded by horizon. Three. What I wanted, I couldn't name, but the longing felt more real than what I could touch, constant as labor. Some nights I lay on the ground for hours, drunk with that view of the heavens, as if those thousand thousand stars each held me by a thread, their imperceptible shuffle spinning around me some cosmic cocoon. So I endured the days and months and years that kept me from adulthood, the time of fulfillment, or so I thought. Growing up brought an end only to a kind of indentured servitude, taught me to distinguish loss from lack. Four, these days it's TV commercials, the happy clan hawking cars and fortified cereals, a kind of contentment bartered for with longing or need. Anything is attainable in fantasy. It takes so much to learn just this, the things we need we don't get in this world. Some say we're lucky to be alive, to have our chance each day to fight, get by. I say, what's lack or chance, excuse me, what's luck or chance? or choice for that matter. I take the offerings of this slim life, hunger, like memory, some kind of assurance, the body open, unable to be filled. And uh, just one more um, before we talk a bit. <clears throat> Also want to um, let the audience know if you can't tell already that I'm a bit under the weather, so um, you may hear me sniffling and 
hopefully and not sneezing and coughing too much. <clears throat> Night work. In the changeling air before morning, they are silhouettes, dark ones, with the duskiness of pre-dawn on them and the shading of dust and sweat, busying themselves in buildings on scaffolds and on the black washed pavements. They are phantoms of the city, guardians of parking lots and lobby desks, toll booths, meters, the all nights and delivery trucks. At bus stops, they are sentinels and the drivers. Launderers and cleaners readying the offices and the untidy houses of privilege. Cooks heaping up meals for the well-fed, the disabled or the indifferent. Trash takers making room for more. Nurses eternally watching. When my mother Starting the stove at 5 a.m. looked out the window. She saw her father days after his funeral. Had he come back to the field and the plowing left undone when the chain snapped and struck him, nodding his throat into pain and its aftershock of silence? Did he return to reclaim the work like a part of himself unfulfilled and his story untold? He is with us still, she said, to the inchoate brightness. He is there even now. Spirits are much the same in those uncensored hours, flitting dim figures, half-remembered apparitions, whose industry renews and undergirds our own. They are our counterparts, the whispering echo of that other turning as we turn in bed the sigh that heaves in the wake of, un of some unseen act, in the darkness, where a cycle of making and unmaking unfolds. If anything could help us to believe in their benign presence, it is the workers, perpetual as stars, a collective of eyes and hands conjuring. <clears throat> Thank you so much for those for those poems. Maybe we'll start with a question or two that tie back to that collection. And then we already have some some viewer questions starting to come in as well. Um, so um, so among other places, one of your uh, poems has been published in an anthology of Southern Southern African-American poets, Nikki Finney's 2006 Kape Kanem anthology. Could you talk a little bit about your relationship to the South and to being classified as a Southern poet? Yes, yes. And, and in fact, that's um, why I began where I did with those poems, um, to give some sense of uh, hopefully that context. I would say that my relationship to the South is, um, is one of ambivalence uh, still at this point in my life. Um, and uh, I love, both love the South, and I guess I won't say hate the South, but I both love the South, and I, um, and I sort of feel a, a great tension, um, and, um, and in some ways a pushing away from um, that place. What I do love about it, and, and what I feel rooted in, is the, the memories of nature, um, the sense of place, uh, the sort of wildness and, and, and mysteries of that southern rural landscape that I grew up in. Um, so there's a sense of the real uh, wonder of, um, of, of that place and the, of the rural life um, and the joys of um, my encounters with the land, um, as well as the sense of strength that I got from seeing my family, my community eke out an existence in that place. Um, and so on the one hand, there is that, that sense of joy and that sense of um, love that I, that I got from that place um, in terms of the love that was given to me from certain members of my family and community and, and also the, just the sense of, of um, being cradled by nature. But then at the same time, there is that sense of the terror of the segregated South. <coughs> 
excuse me, um, the, the South that I was born into was one of um, the upheavals in the wake of the civil rights movement. And, um, and one of my earliest memories as a child and what I would count as my first political memory was of hearing on the radio uh, Strom Thurmond say that as long as he was um, in office, he would make sure that, that uh, Negroes, uh, and that may not have been the exact word that he used, but um, that black folks in the South never got, the, or black folks in South Carolina, which is where I grew up, never got the, got the vote. And I remember hearing that at, um, you know, maybe four years of age and that sticking with me. Um, so, you know, so that memory, those memories of the, of the South, um, you know, so th in that way, the South is sort of brought with fear and, um, and the sense of abuse, the abuse of the society as well as a sort of um, abuse in my home because of my father's alcoholism. So I have to say love and terror, you know, <laughs> there's, that, um, there's that ambivalence. Um, but the South is my original home place and uh, the things that, that help to shape me come from there. Yes, and you've, you've, in the recent years, returned to the South after a number of years away. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that has influenced your work since you've been <clears throat> back, now living in Georgia, mm -hmm. back to where you, closer to where you're originally from. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the influence of the South has never left my work. It's always been in my work. Um, and I don't know that coming back to Georgia has had a, a big influence in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe it, the difference is that it's, I'm in the urban South now, um, whereas I grew up in the rural South. But I don't see a lot of difference in terms of the way that I connect to people here. Um, there's a kind of sense of community and connection that I find with people in the South that's familiar, even in this urban context, where probably most of the people that I'm interacting with on a daily basis weren't born here. Um, but uh, I think maybe just in looking at the work, what has perhaps changed more of late is a use of maybe longer lines, more languid lines in my poetry and a, and a return to um, more prose form, sort of the vignette, uh, the, the prose form, prose poem form. Um, and so I don't know if that has to do with a sense of the, the rhythms of the South, but I think that's the main thing that I noted of, of late in my work. <clears throat> that's really interesting. And, but I, we, we better turn to, turn to a few viewer questions because they're coming in, which is great. Keep them mm -hmm. coming. Um, so someone is asking for us, um, is writing poetry for you a solitary pursuit or do you share poems with others while they're still taking shape, while they're in process? Um, nowadays, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Nowadays, it's, it's more solitary than ever. Um, I certainly miss the days when I uh, was more in contact with uh, with the former members of the collective and and uh, other um, writing friends, but uh, all of my writing folks are so dispersed around the country. And even though there is uh, internet uh, and social media, I tend not to try to workshop in that way. Um, and I particularly, I think, um, need to spend, as, it, as I'm a very slow writer, I need to spend a lot of time in my process. And I don't feel that early on uh, feedback in the process is, is really helpful for me. And that feedback probably comes much later when the poems are pretty much finished. So I would say on the whole, then it is more of a solitary um, experience in that way and, and not a sort of work, a lot of workshopping that goes on as I'm writing, as I'm in the midst of the process. And you brought up the Darkroom Collection, which mm -hmm. I know uh, many people are interested in hearing about your involvement with some of those incredibly influential writers. Um, could you talk a little bit, I guess, building off of what you were just saying then about how working with those collaborators um, in, and those visiting mentors who came through the Darkroom Collective as well, people like Sonia Sanchez, 
who would uh, write the introduction for your first book. Could you talk then a little bit about how that influenced your, I guess, earlier work in terms of some of those collaborations that you helped make possible with the co-founding of the Dark Room Collective? Mm -hmm. Well, I would just say about the Dark Room, um, for my own personal growth, the Dark Room was the beginning for me. Um, I really had been reading and absorbing a lot, but I had not been writing um, poems. And so I do think of the dark room as really that kind of fertile ground out of which my, um, my life as a writer grew. Um, the dark room was also important in establishing community. So again, you know, I think I write, I tend to write and, um, a lot in isolation, but I never think of myself as totally being in isolation because I, even if I'm not asking for feedback on poems from writers, I always feel like I'm in community with writers uh, on social media or, um, you know, just in conversation. Recently, I was in New York and, you know, sat down and had dinner with a, a few of the former collective members. And I kind of feel like there's that, that literary family that's always out there. Um, but really at the point when the dark room came into being, that was not the state of my life. I, I wasn't sure of what path my life was taking at that point. Um, and so that was really the springboard for me going into a graduate program in creative writing, um, you know, after having gone in a total, totally different direction as an undergrad. And then after, you know, between college and grad school, sort of taking on various um, jobs and, and just sort of figuring out because I was really interested in everything. And I think that's kind of the hallmark of an artist. So that was probably nudging me towards that without my even knowing, but the dark room is what solidified it. Um, being in community with, those, with my peers, and then also to have the wonderful experience of creating a community forum where we call those writers who came through the dark room um, our living literary ancestors. Um, and of, of course, uh, you know, I'm sure that the audience is aware of the origins of the dark room and, and, and um, and for those who aren't, uh, it was sort of catalyzed by the death of uh, James Baldwin and our um, attending his funeral. And, um, and then on the ride back from uh, New York up to Cambridge, uh, Thomas Ayers Ellis, who was my housemate at the time, had this brilliant idea of taking our, you know, crazy cluttered living room and turning it into a literary salon. And uh, everything sort of changed after that. He and I had really been, um, you know, sort of sharing this love for literature and, and, and beginning to think about um, the black literary tradition and, and how important it was in our lives and what we could do with it. And then that moment sort of catalyzed everything. And then meeting all of these fellow um, spirits along the way, um, some of whom you've mentioned and others like uh, John Keane, who is a poet and a fiction writer. Um, as well, uh, Tisa Bryant, uh, you know, I, I get into trouble when I start naming names because there's so many of us. Um, but in addition to some of the folks you've mentioned, those are um, folks who are out there. Janice Lowe was one of our founders, along with Thomas Ayers Ellis. And so um, the mentors that uh, are numerous, um, again, uh, if I start naming names, I'll leave people out. But to have that intimate um, relationship to some of those writers who came through, uh, like Tori Derricott and, and Cornelius Eady, who went on to found Cave Canem, um, like Derek Walcott, who, uh, you know, Nobel laureate who read in our living room. I mean, just to have that kind of access to that caliber of artists. Um, and so many, many others. Um, you mentioned Sonia Sanchez, but Intazaki Shange, Yusef Komanyaka, um, uh, Samuel Delaney, uh, uh, fiction writers and poets and playwrights and it was a wonderful um, beginning for me in what had been something of uh, I guess a fallow space uh, having come out of um, what I found a dissatisfactory um, experience with the elitism of Harvard <laughs> so that established for me the kind of community um, and place that could help me flourish and to help all of us flourish, really. Yeah, and you mentioned the relationship between the Darkroom Collective and, for example, those who would go on to found Kaveh Kanem. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have, some people are saying, this flourishing of 
sites such as Kave Kanem or poets coming together and calling themselves the Afrolechian poets, those kinds mm -hmm. of collectives, gatherings. Um, what, I guess, as, as one of the founding figures of the earlier organization, right? What is your take on this, this proliferation of spaces that critics are pointing out in terms of Kave Kanem being really significant in terms of the Afrolechian poets providing a space for Southern black writers, things mm -hmm. like that? Um, well, of, of course, I think it's wonderful. Um, the mantra of the dark room that we borrowed from Clarence Major was total life is what we want. So that speaks to me very much about the sense of total life. The idea with the dark room collective was it wasn't, you know, at least in my mind, it wasn't a place that was necessarily meant to launch careers. Um, but, you know, out of creating community and creating a space where people feel supported and, and their voices are valid and their experience is valid, all types of voices and experiences are valid. I, you know, I imagine it couldn't help but do things like launch careers and launch other efforts. And so this flourishing and, you know, I'm saying there's something, there was something in, in the, the zeitgeist maybe that the darkroom folks tapped into and other folks um, were tapping into at that time so that there was a burgeoning, you know, uh, going on and continuing to this day. Our, our moment on that stage was somewhat limited yeah, in terms of its duration. But I think the, um, I think the legacy of the dark room has been, <coughs> excuse me, that um, we, we created a space for more and more voices. Um, and we, tried to smash through what felt like this kind of elitism and exclusion um, in the larger literary establishment. Um, and in a sense, in our own way, it was sort of like, we don't need your party, you know? <laughs> We've got our own party, <laughs> you know? Um, we'll make our own party so that the darkroom gatherings really did feel like parties um, in, the, in the very best sense where, um, you know, serious parties, where serious work was being done, but also serious celebration serious self-affirmation, um, you know, serious affirmation of the community and the, the tradition that, um, that we came out of and that we owed our own work to. And so I just see Kabe Kahnem and Black Took Collective and the Afro-Lechian poets and the numerous, numerous uh, groups that um, are out there um, as being part of that long continuum. <clears throat> so one of our viewers, Cynthia, is asking, um, I, she says, I love the book Ash, as many of us do. Thank you. Asking, how do you envision your work in terms of relationship to the visual? And how did you pick the cover art for Ash? Okay, well, let me just say, because I, I think that's still a sticking point with me that I did not choose the cover art. <laughs> so I wasn't lucky enough to do that. And the cover art that I had proposed um, the press rejected. So I didn't get to choose my cover art. It, I think it would have been quite different. Mm, okay. But even so, the visual is very important to me. And um, I think that's probably clear in the poems that, um, that you know, the image is, uh, is oftentimes the catalyst for the work. Um, and I often think of, um, I would guess, analogs to, to my process or what I'm what I feel resonates for me um, in my experience in the world. I find analogs in visual artists. I love film, so I'm a real uh, um, cinemaphile. I love visual art, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm one of those people who's kind of jealous that I didn't have the, the, the skills to be a visual artist, a painter, a sculptor, um, or a dancer even. So all of those things in terms of the visual uh, movement and image speak to me, and I hope the work is infused with those things um, because I do feel that that's what moves me. That's what um, you know moves my heart, um, and so I feel like that's important to the work. <clears throat> right on the heels of that, someone is asking another compliment. I find your poetry profound and elegant. So, thank you. How, how did you know? that poetry was your pathway to sharing your talents and insights with the world. Suppose you had alluded to not knowing that mm. after your undergraduate experience. Um, so I guess yeah. how did you come to, come to mm -hmm. realizing that? 
Well, I think that's a wonderful question because I think we do know. We know when we, do, when we think we don't know. And I think there was always something in me probably urging me toward that. And um, what I have to say uh, in terms of my childhood was that there was a lot of silencing in my childhood. And so um, I think of the poetry, I think of myself as a poet um, in response to that early silencing so that I knew somehow in my, in my deepest self, I knew that I had a voice and I knew that that voice um, needed to come out in some way. So that, so I don't think of poetry as, as therapeutic in that sense, but I do feel like that somehow that there's that connection, there's a relationship to that silence and to the poetry. Um, and I guess what I, what I was ignoring was that when I was an undergrad, I was sort of pushed in the direction. Well, I shouldn't say pushed in the direction. I sort of, I sort of oriented myself in a direction where I thought I would do something what is conventionally thought of as useful uh, in terms of working towards a degree that would give me a career and not listening to the real longings of, of, my, of my spirit, which was I was fascinated by language. I was fascinated by uh, the sounds, the rhythms of speech. I was fascinated by the visual, by the phenomenal world. All of those things um, were in me. And I just had to come to a point where I could honor that and, and not be afraid. And so the, again, the dark room, as I say, it was a beginning for me because here is where I could see this kind of raging creative life uh, going on around me and the choices that people were making um, that confirmed what I was feeling inside. So I don't know that, that the dark room was when I realized that I was a poet. I think I realized it early on but uh, somehow was not able to acknowledge it, that that knowing wasn't, um, wasn't honored until, until I found a real venue and a platform for doing it in the dark room. Mm. <clears throat> building, oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse building, me. Building off of that, someone has asked immediately. So then in that process, how did you further come to embrace your voice as mm -hmm. a writer? distinctive approach mm -hmm. um, I think that's a harder question to answer um, I think you know as 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 writers I mean as artists I think we're working on many levels so I think there are many there's certainly the cognitive um, process that is involved in writing but I think, and I rely very much on the intuitive, on the instinctual um, aspects of the creative process. And so I think that once I started to write poems, I mean, it was certainly wonderful to have some affirmation from, you know, my peers in the Darkroom Collective and even from writers that I admired greatly. But I think it, within myself, there was a knowing and a sureness when I, when I um, produced some poems and I, I sounded them to myself. Or um, so I, you know, not trying to sound mystical about the process, but but there is a sense that just like yes, you know, this is this is um, this is something you can do, and this is something meaningful. And it's funny that it's poetry where you're called upon to go around and give readings because I'm I'm very much an introvert, and I don't I don't like to get up in public, and I don't like per se. I shouldn't say I don't like it. it. It makes me uncomfortable. So it makes me push against some things that um, in myself that would probably keep me quiet and keep me in the house and, uh, you know, not keep me sharing that work. But there's something so meaningful to me about the engagement with language, about the engagement um, with word and, and sound and, and music, the um, inherent musicality of, of dealing with language. That's so appealing. And then again, the other aspect, as I mentioned before, the visual, the cinematic, you know, I think about, say, someone like Kevin Jerome, uh, Everson's um, films, I kind of see those as analogs to what I'm trying to do in my writing, where I'm dealing with the, the, the simple aspect of living um, uh, and, you know, the people around me being very plain, not celebrated people, maybe sort of unsung people in the grand sweep of history, 
but who, but an inquiry into those lies and an inquiry into my own life uh, and to being and, and trying to discern what is meaningful and why it's meaningful in trying to live a life of integrity in the kind of society world we live in, which is, you know, so full of, I think, anti-human impulses. Um, and so when I see work like that, like uh, um, Everson's work or Charles Burnett's work or Julie Dash's work or um, Ava DuVernay's work and other, um, and then visual artists like Romare Bearden and, and um, Whitfield Lovell and, and um, Alison Saar. And I mean, there's just so many um, visual artists too. So when I think about it, I, I guess I feel like there's a kind of knowing and a sense that um, my voice um, is in that community and that company of art in the world and it, and it feels right there. Mm. And since you're, since you're speaking about <clears throat> your, your perceptions of these other artists, someone is asking an interesting question um, about your role, I guess, in bringing other types of work out into the world. So she's asking, um, what do you look for or what in the past have you looked for in submissions, for example, when you were uh, as, an, as an advisory editor at Calumu, mm -hmm. in terms of what takes a writing, a piece of writing from being interesting just kind of to oneself to being important to others in a way that is worthy of being published or what kinds of factors do people believe to be important in submissions that maybe then don't actually influence what the editor on the other end is considering, right? Um, so I guess it's a question about your, your work in fostering other poets. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I do with my teaching is I, well, because I love the notion that, and, and actually I tell my students that really, let's begin with the notion that, that art bears witness. So art bears witness, um, and if you are bearing witness, you know, if th that requires a kind of, I think, observation, a kind of examination, a kind of exploration um, that is rooted in, in honesty and integrity. And how that comes across in the writing can, can vary, can differ um, from, from work to work. But I, th I think that there's a, a sense early on um, with my students that it's, it's an exercise. You know, we've talked about elements of craft and it's sort of like, am I hitting these elements of craft? Um, and so then I kind of come back at them with this notion of if art is bearing witness and it's pushing us in some way, it's trying to, in some way, I love the, you know, I use this term too, the, the poet Matthew Zapruder talks about the poem mind and how, um, when we encounter a poem, we move along with the poem mind. And I add to that the poem heart, you know, how do we move along with the, the poem heart in terms of transforming, uh, at least engaging another's consciousness and, and perhaps even transforming the consciousness, sort of pushing us out of a, a stasis that we, that we might find ourselves in. I think that's why we go to poetry. Um, so I think that, you know, looking at the poetry in terms of either writing it or, or thinking about how it might communicate to someone else, I think that's where you, you want to think about it. You know, what sort of questions um, does, the, does the poetry um, sort of engage us in? And, and, and when I talk to the students, I say, you know, poems ask real questions or they evoke real questions in us. And if you're not dealing with those real questions in some way, I think that that, that, that may be the 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 missing element that may be the place where the poem doesn't quite hit you know um the 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 wonderful use of language or other aesthetic elements um could certainly be there but there's something about the heart and the gravitas that equally needs to be there that's what engages me that's what makes me wake up and go wow okay that's interesting i want to hear more of this voice i want to um i want to take time i want to work um, with whatever questions, whatever um, things that it's, it's arise in me when I encounter this work. Um, you know, Emily Dickinson, I, I think it was Emily Dickinson maybe the, who said that, you know, you know it's poetry and, and you feel like the top of your head is blown off. <laughs> or, and I'm, certainly there are other, um, I think, metaphors that can apply. 
But where, when something moves in you and something challenges you, or even something maybe confounds you, but in a, but in a good way, where there's a, a, a pleasing and an intriguing kind of mystery or question um, or problem that I'm left with with the poem, those are the things I kind of look to because I think those things come out of a real sense of um, trying to bear witness through one's work, um, uh, trying to engage and trying to stimulate um, another's consciousness in that way. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that is, I think, some of the things that, that I think about um, when I come across poems, because, you know, poems represent so many different facets of experience, human experience. And so to tie it to to one, you know, narrow aesthetic channel isn't helpful. So I try to go to what I think is the deeper human ground of how we're uh, communicating to one another. Yeah, that issue you brought up of the gravitas mm -hmm. to be there as well ties ties nicely to a question someone asked minutes ago that we're, we're getting through them um, regarding your views on the, the fact that college professors have always faced sometimes very significant ramifications for their public beliefs, their writing. Mm -hmm. Examples such as uh, the publicized events of, of Professor Stephen Salida at the University of Illinois, things like that. So this person's wondering, do you, when you're writing, consider the ramifications that that work will have in those potentially negative ways? If so, how much? And which kinds of audiences are you conceptualizing when you're writing the work? Mm -hmm. My first impulse was to say, no, I don't think about it at all. But I do think that in some sense that that question is, is in, the back of, in the back of my mind at some point, not early on, certainly not early on. Um, but in terms of what I publish or... Yeah, I think for the most part, no, I, I don't worry about that. I kind of feel like you, the institution, if they can't, if they can't support me, then I probably don't belong there. And this, of course, I'm saying, you know, thinking about the current climate of, you know, the, the, the neoliberal university and all of the, you know, kinds of concerns around that. Um, but I teach at a historically black women's college. Um, and our mission really is around empowering black women's voices in the world. Um, and so if I thought about it to any extent, um, then I might question my work in terms of what is it doing in that regard? You know, is the work in some way um, consonant with this, I think, larger quest for Black American poetry, and, and probably not just for Black American poetry, but for um, anyone uh, who is concerned about social justice and anyone of conscience, how consonant is, is it with that larger quest for liberation? Um, and so I feel like, you know, if the work is consonant with that, then um, let the chips fall where they may. I don't expect, and the, the, the reference to the professor that you mentioned, I'm not aware of, of, um, of that person's work and how that might have been challenging for him, but I think on the whole, in my position as a professor in a historically black college for women, um, whose mission is to empower black women in the world and to, and to be in, engaged in the, the quest for social justice and, and certainly liberation um, for, for oppressed and marginalized people, I, I, um, that would be my only concern. <laughs> really. Um, but as an artist, as I sit down to do the work, I'm not, you know, juggling um, those concerns. Not really. I'm not saying, well, you know, will this, will this work make Spellman look bad? Or, you know, will, will I lose my position in, in terms of my teaching? Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like that's not as much of a concern. And maybe in the in the very particular situation of teaching at Spelman College, that is not as troubling for me as it might be for some of my other, um, you know, higher education colleagues. Speaking about teaching, um, someone has written in that they they know you recently attended a conference on the contemplative mind in higher yes. education, and so they're wondering 
if there is a role or what kind of role does that question of mindfulness play in your work, both as a poet, but also in terms of your teaching practice? Mm -hmm. So in terms of my, excuse me. <clears throat> All right, so in terms of my, um, my, my own work, well, the contemplative is important to me, uh, again, because I think of myself as uh, someone who is oriented toward that sense of the interior life um, and the very uh, ways in which it determines my being in the world. Um, so that sense of kind of reflection on what it means to be human, you know, first of all. What does it mean to be this kind of consciousness um, that is connected to so many others and, and holds so much responsibility in terms of the life I try to lead and the ways that I try to impact others? And I think that features in my work in the sense that I am always, I think, concerned about that um, very ground of human relationship and connection um, and fostering love and uh, empathy and, and compassion in the world. Um, and so I hope the, the, the work then becomes a, a space for that too. Um, and then in terms of my teaching, I take that orientation into the classroom because I think the contemplative uh, orientation asks us to look at one another um, in the most, you know, sort of naked sense of we're all here um, living this human existence together um, and that we have such great possibility uh, for making that human experience um, one of integrity and uh, growth and support from one another. Um, and so to take that orientation into the classroom is to think about how that then factors into the ways that I relate to my students and what I teach them in terms of what is meaningful, um, what, uh, what a life of, um, of meaning and integrity can be, can look like, um, and then how that can foster some sort of transformation in the world. So, yeah, so that's how I think about it. And then in, in terms of the 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 sort of movement that's been going on in contemplative education is as ways of breaking down, um, you know, these very sort of compartmentalized um, ways of approaching learning, um, and and also these very elitist and oppressive ways of um, of fostering le learning. So um, so I feel like you know there's that kind of holistic sense in which it touches those different areas of my life. <clears throat> the wonderful Dr. Jerry Ward is here with us, so I want to make sure to answer one of his questions. Yes. Um, and he has asked what your thoughts are about whether it is at all useful to distinguish the aesthetic features of 21st century poetry from those we find in 21st century prose. Uh, big question. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say um, th that. All right, that's a big question, and 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 also thank you, uh, Dr. Ward, for being there in the audience and um, and pushing me to think about that. So I guess my question would be, and I'm guessing, of, of course, that it's in reference to literary prose, and um, and so I think I had some questions about that question too. So um in terms of making distinctions between aesthetic features, I guess on the, on the basic level of fundamental elements of, of the craft, of the creative craft, um, I, guess, I guess you could say in certain ways, no. Um, there is there's a kind of way in which the aesthetic features of poetry and prose uh, you know, overlap in terms of what they deal with. Um, uh, you know, voice and story and you know, those kinds of elements of, um, of, uh, of expression, literary expression. Um, but I guess I also wonder if the question has to do with a, a way of thinking about how the um, conventions of different genres 
are being blurred and maybe merged and, and, and hybridized. I wondered if that is the question aiming toward that. So I don't know if, if Dr. Ward is, is still there and responding to that. Um, I think in my more traditional um, impulse, I, I would say that I do think that there are distinctions between the poetry and the prose that are still relevant. When I think about the ways in which um, you know, poetry operates around these, these kinds of elliptical gestures, um, the gaps, the leaps, um, the compression that's inherent in some of the approaches. And then again, I think too about the rhythmic approaches. Uh, I can't help but think about spoken word and, and the ways in which um, that particular of style of uh, 21st, well, 20th into 21st century poetry really highlights um, a, a, a big difference in terms of formal qualities um, between poetry and prose. But then I also think about the various types of texts that are being produced across the genres that, that is this kind of hybridization, um, you know, with, um, now I was recently reading uh, Jacqueline Woodson's wonderful memoir in verse. And then I think about uh, Claudia Rankin's um, collection Citizen, which some, you know, question whether we call that poetry or whether we call that prose. And then of course, there's the introduction of the visual, um, forms into it. So, so again, I, I think there's a, for me, a kind of yes and no impulse. My, I, I don't think of myself as an experimental poet by any means, but I think what, what the um, sort of great experiments that are going on with poetry and with prose um, these days are sort of making that, the answer to that question more of a no uh, than a yes. <laughs> so. And Dr. Ward has jumped on and said that he's really asking also about how readers react in terms mm -hmm. of that, I guess, that blurring of genres. Mm -hmm. um, be, okay, can you repeat that? How are readers reacting? Yeah, exactly. What is, what is the relationship to audience in terms mm -hmm. of that blurring mm -hmm. genres? Okay, well, I think for... I think for the 21st century audience, there is a sense of, of blurring and merging um, and hybridization um, in terms of some of these aesthetic features. And I guess in, in terms of thinking about audience for the, the 21st century viewer, um, I mean audience, and I've said viewer because I was thinking about the ways in which the, the digital forms and the digital media and um, the intersection of the kinds of new technologies that we have into, into the writing, into the production of our literary text is changing that. So I, I think that in a lot of ways, the audience is determining that sense that there is emerging and maybe the features aren't as much distinctive um, as we have thought in the past. I know we're, we're getting close to running out of time, unfortunately. I didn't know if, are you still interested in <coughs> sorry, a poem or two? Um, we do have a couple other questions we could get to, so it's up to you how you'd like to, how you'd like to end things. Um, I think, well, if there's time, you know, I can answer another question, but I, I'll probably try to end it with one poem. That would be if there's, good. If there's time for that. That would be um, so while I'm, while I'm looking for a poem, maybe there's one more question yes. that um, I can entertain. So someone has asked, there are many, many different definitions of the South, people referring to Bible Belt or below the Mason-Dixon line, other types of definitions. So they're wondering, what kind of geographical or cultural areas do you encompass when you're talking about your relationship with the South? Mm. Well, I would say that the, the Bible Belt South was a big um, factor in my childhood, that notion of the South. Um, but I've never quite embraced that. Uh, and so, and now my current experience of the South is one that is, uh, certainly that, that that's there, that's still fully an element, 
but I also see so much um, migration um, back to the south of, uh, of uh, folks from all parts of the country. And I think that has certainly shifted that more sort of conservative um, element of the Bible Belt notion of the South. So the South to me today feels a lot more um, mixed and, and culturally mixed. And I think that is probably what, um, that orientation is probably what propelled me out of the South in the beginning, um, looking for more, a more expansive notion of identity and then coming back to the South now my personal sense of, uh, of the South has always been, I feel, uh, expansive in it. And now I see that in many more manifestations around me. So I feel like that identity of the South is, is broader, much broader. Um, and, uh, and pinning it down to some more, um, uh, I guess, traditional or historical notions of the South is much more elusive now. And thankfully so. And I guess um, to end, I will, <clears throat> I'll read a poem. Um, maybe that speaks in a, in a small way to that. The poem is titled Claim. And the epigraph is from Walt Whitman. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. Sun reaching through the bus window makes her a flame. White cloth twining her head ignites the tip of a body, dressed all in white, as if readied for dipping in the Sunday stream. Though she hardly knew the woman who would have counseled her preparation, reminding her not to fight the preacher, just lay back, meet the water with the ease of the unburdened, who had left these backwoods dispossessed and angry by this same road, but northward, like ancestors who traced rivers, moss, nocturnal light to the city. This trip reverses that repudiation of the South, as she recounts her grandmother's deathbed wishes, reviews her own bitter struggles, she's a torch glowering in midday. All cruelties mark this soil. Its memory takes trope and jolts her crippled back records, and she winces, reminded of a new corporate toll. But a disability settlement's reluctant reparation is just enough to make Per, is just enough to purchase her inheritance, make her the family's agent, fulfilling old ambition. Gnarled braids escape her head wrap, signify on native trees warped by heavy fruit. The house those trees built, tap roots drawing her forebears' blood and sweat, their cries and prayers into the very walls will be her grandmother's again, the greyhounds bringing their twin spirits home, where she'll make for them an unassailable shrine. Thank you for sharing that, that work with us. That was mm -hmm. wonderful. And thank you to everyone for being present today. Yes. Um, thank you all. Thanks, thanks to the audience and thanks to the University of Kansas and to Dr. Mary Emma Graham for this wonderful project and thank you all. And in closing, I would like to say, uh, please join us for the third webinar in this series, which will be featuring poet Nikki Finney on Wednesday, November 11th at 2 p.m. Central San Standard Time. And we would like to formally thank Thermal Geringer Academic Resource Center, especially a huge thank you to Kia Cunningham and John Perkins for making this webinar possible. And of course, a special thanks to our wonderful guest, Sharon Strange, for taking the time to be with us today. <coughs> and most of all, thank you so much to all of you for sharing this exciting event with us today. A downloadable podcast from today's webinar will be available on our website soon. In the meantime, don't forget to follow us online on the HBW website, on Twitter, and on our blog about events related to Black writing. 
and we'll see you on Wednesday, November 11th, 2 p.m. Central Time for the discussion with poet Nikki Finney. Thank you so much, Professor Strange. Thank you.